This is the WOW Signal Podcast, a podcast produced by the Dream of the Open Channel. Welcome. This is your host, Paul Carr, and this is episode two of season three of the WOW Signal. This episode focuses on asteroid mining, and in a few moments, we're going to welcome Dr. Martin Elvis of the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Dr. Elvis has done a lot of work on the basic science underlying asteroid mining. Now, as you may recall, in Season 1, we did spend an episode talking about asteroid mining, not only human asteroid mining, but possible detection of alien asteroid mining with Duncan Forgan. But in this episode, we're going to focus on human asteroid mining, and in particular, how we know a particular asteroid is worth mining and what asteroids are worth mining, and how likely it is that an asteroid is worth mining, and how we would go and prospect that asteroid for ore. Now, ore in this case could be either some kind of mineral we want to extract from the asteroid, a very popular group of of elements is what's known as the platinum group elements, and the platinum group uh, it's not just platinum, it's a number of other elements that could be extracted. We'll talk about that. But another thing that is very vital in space, we have plenty of it here on Earth, but very in space is water. Now, what can you do with water? Well, of course, you can drink it. You can feed it to your plants. You can feed it to your animals. But something else is even more important. You can make fuel out of water. Water is very easy to split into hydrogen and oxygen. And if you have hydrogen and oxygen, you can recombine them in an explosive reaction that that can be used to propel a rocket. This has actually had been going on for a long time in rocketry. The Atlas Centaur, particularly the Centaur upper stage, is a hydrogen-oxygen rocket, as was the shuttle main engine. So this sort of thing is is very mature technology. The question is, can we make it in space? And the answer is, yes, we can, if we know where the water is and the water is sufficiently abundant on those asteroids to find it. So what Dr. Elvis has done, using his experience in astrophysics and astronomy, has looked at how we can find these asteroids. And as we will discuss, there are some things that can be done both by agencies like NASA and ESA and also by private contractors. I'm quite sympathetic to his idea of using the profit motive to make this happen. Not everybody thinks that's going to work as well as I do, but I I think it will work. But the whole idea of bootstrapping an economy in space will depend largely on finding water. Now, there's also water on the moon. We believe that there is. There's probably a lot of water at the moon's south pole. But Dr. Elvis will explain to you why he is biased towards the asteroids. And, of course, the asteroids are on our way to where we want to go, Mars and beyond. So I would like you to introduce Dr. Elvis now. The plan is this is part one of two. We'll have another scientist on soon to tell us more about the science of asteroids and what asteroids can be mined and how we might detect them with various types of telescopes. I'm here with... Dr. Martin Elvis of the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Uh, welcome, El- Martin Elvis. Hello, Paul. Right. 
Uh, what I'd like to do is one of the questions a couple of listeners had was they they saw your CV and that you've done a lot of work on uh, at, in uh, energetic galaxies and so forth. Uh, so how did you get from that to asteroids? Uh, well, in order to study uh, active galaxies, quasars, they, these are supermassive black holes that are uh, having gas fall down onto them, and because they the gas speeds up so fast uh, in the huge gravitational pull of the black hole, uh, when it collides with anything, it, it gets extremely hot and makes uh, ultraviolet and X-ray emission. And so the only way to study those are from space. Uh, because they just, luckily, perhaps, those two don't get through the atmosphere so well. And so uh, my career has been finding first that they did emit X-rays and then trying to understand how and why. And to do that, we've needed more and more powerful observatories. And we are very lucky at the moment that in NASA has a set of great observatories, the Hubble Space Telescope, of course, and the ultraviolet and the optical, and the Spitzer Space Telescope in the infrared, and the, my favorite, the Chandra X-ray Observatory, which works in the X-ray band, which is, I've been associated with for a long time. So I've had a lot of association with space projects. And as I thought about what we needed next, it was clear that we wouldn't be able to afford it, that uh, we've had three generations of uh, beautiful space observatories matched across all the different wave band, so we've opened these new windows on the universe during my career, and it's been a wonderful ride, uh, but I, I hate to think it's over, and the trouble is the next generation is, is so much more expensive than the one we've uh, managed to get so far. So the James Webb Space Telescope is clocking in at nearly $9 billion to cost to the U.S., plus a billion thrown in from uh, the European, ESA space, uh, European Space Agency, ESA. Mm -hmm. So, oof. How are we going to do it? How are we going to get the next bigger, better range of observatories? And so I'm, I think, actually, that there are technology tricks we can play that will improve X-ray and UV and what have you uh, in the next round. But it, it's getting tight. There's not much room for uh, expanding these projects much. And a lot of people say, oh, we'll go international. We'll have the Europeans, the Japanese, the Chinese. And you can do that, but you do it once. And you're left with one big telescope, and that's not very nice because you tend to get groupthink when you have just one telescope and people sort of march along to, uh, to follow the, the latest trend instead of having a variety of opinions coming into play, which is what really good science is about. So, how, what, so the only real answer, I think, is to make it cheaper so that we can get bigger observatories for the same cost as now or even less. And that sounds crazy, except we all have been hearing about how SpaceX, Elon Musk and SpaceX are going to bring the cost of launches down. And even bringing it down a little bit would make a big difference. But you could bring them down in principle, oh, oh 10 times cheaper you can make them before the fuel cost got anywhere near the uh, same fraction of fuel cost you have for, say, an air, airplane flying across country. So right now, the fuel cost of a rocket like a Falcon 9, SpaceX Falcon 9, is half a percent of the total cost of the rocket. So there's a long way to go before you hit some kind of limit. And so I said, well, how, to myself, how can we bring that down? And I, in the end, I realized the only way to do it is the all-American way of, of using capitalism, because capitalism brings down the price of things very effectively. It's a tool to do that, in a sense. Right? It's really uh, effective, and it's based on needing to make the bottom line. Uh, and if you think about it, DOE and, uh, DOD and NASA don't really have to worry about how much the thing costs. They're not trying to make a profit. But if I was trying to do something in space and make a profit, then I really have to worry about how much things cost. And just having that as a priority is the kind of uh, has a great magical effect of bringing out technologies that will help you do that and, and ways of operating that will help you do that. So I believe that's going to be true. What could you do in space uh, that would make a profit? And there's several great, fairly near-term things. We've all heard about the space tourism with the suborbital flights on Virgin Galactic, but also x -Core and probably others. There's the private research labs that Bigelow Aerospace are pushing, which seem on a five or uh, so, yeah, timescales will be very plausible. They'll have commercial crew vehicles that can dock with them and take people there. 
they're trying out a module next year on space station. So it's all it's all go. Um, you could mine the moon or the resources of the South Pole in particular, uh, and you could mine the asteroids. And so, for two reasons, I think mining the asteroids has the most uh, the biggest future, and is something I can deal with. Uh, the, it's something I can deal with because it turns out that understanding the asteroids and finding the right ones requires a lot of astronomy techniques, which I know a lot about. And it turns out, I think I'm the only uh, astronomer, professional astronomer worldwide, who's really working on this as, as a major project. Uh, and, in, and why it's the biggest thing? It's because simply the asteroids have enormous amount of massive materials that could be valuable for use in space or back on Earth. So that, I think they're the ones to concentrate on. So that's what I'm doing. Okay. Now, in 2013, you wrote a paper called uh, How Many Ore-Bearing Asteroids? Yeah. Where you tried to break down the problem uh, of... Now, first of all, I mean, ore-bearing, you don't just mean that it has elements on it. Right. You mean that we can get to those asteroids and get back and, and mine them and so forth. That's right. Mark Sonter, uh, uh, who uh, wrote a master's thesis on this years ago, uh, insisted to me that this is the right way to think about it. It's what, the, what it means in the, in the mining industry. If it's all bearing, you can make a profit. Okay, so let's, let's break it down. You, you said uh, you, you wrote down something called probability of ore, and you broke it down into... into uh, Whole series of factors. Four yeah. factors, really. Uh, so, some asteroids have more ore than others. Now, by ore, we mean you meant uh, either, uh, yeah, platinum so I, metals or water, right? Yeah. Yes, that's true. Yes, those are the two things that people talk about. So, platinum and water are both worth about up to fifty thousand dollars a kilogram. Uh, the advantage platinum has is that it's worth that much on the ground now here. Right. And uh, of course, there's worries about oversupply and so on. But right now, you know, there's a market for it. The bad news about platinum is it's hard to extract because the biggest, uh, the most, although the meteorites can be rich, iron meteorites can be very rich in platinum compared with terrestrial mines. It's still, you know, 50 parts per million by mass. And separating that out from all the iron is a lot of work, energetically very expensive. Instead, water is very easy to separate out in the, um, the carbonaceous asteroids. Uh, it's just in, it's in clays, mostly, in, in uh, rocks that have been hydrated, as they say. There may even be ice, pure ice, in many of these uh, asteroids. So that would be pretty easy. You just heat it up and collect the water. Uh, there's technical difficulties, but it's a lot easier. The bad news is there's no market in those. There's a very tiny market in space for water right now. So you have to, uh, like a good capitalist, you have to take a leap of faith and say, I, I, by the time I have, can get this, there will be a market in space. In fact, I'll help it come into being by providing this service. So either one. Now, you focused primarily on near-Earth asteroids. Oh, absolutely. Because they're, uh, I presume because they're a lot easier to get to, get back from. That, yeah, because uh, two reasons. One is just the, the, the feeble state of our rockets today. Um, we can't, you can tell what we can reach, with, what kind of asteroid we can reach by which ones are actually targeted by scientific missions, uh, by Itokawa, uh, by uh, uh, the Japanese with Hayabusa, the uh, Bennu by um, the NASA with um, uh, OSIRIS-REx, and they all have a very low, what we call Delta V. Mm -hmm. So v, delta V is a, an, a way of, of expressing the energy you need to go from a low Earth orbit to a, an orbit that rendezvous with the asteroid. Right. And we do it in kilometers per second. It's a, it's a handy unit. Uh, most the, the, the typical near-Earth asteroid has a delta V of about 6.5 kilometers a second. But the targets are uh, about no bigger than five. And you say, well, that's not very different. Uh, but in fact, it's hugely different uh, in terms of the, I wrote an even earlier paper on ultra low delta B asteroids and the exploration of, uh, ast of, of uh, humans in space. And it turns out uh, that going down in um, 
delta V by that amount can multiply the amount of mass you can take to the asteroid by two to four times. Hmm. And that's a huge factor. It's, it's, the, it's the horrible rocket equation that we have to fight right. all the time because you have to carry your fuel with you. And the more the higher delta V you want, the more fuel you carry. It's, and it turns out to be an exponential, and it's very bad news. So a small change in delta V is a big change in what you can actually take to the asteroid. So, uh, okay, let's uh, say so there's P-type. Uh, about how many asteroids, near-Earth asteroids, do you think are, are possibly a good target just from their type? Uh, so let's do the numbers a minute. There, were, there, there are about 20,000 near-Earth asteroids bigger than 100 meters diameter. So that sounds like a reasonable starting point. And that's enough to get a billion dollars or more of platinum out if, it's that, if you're after platinum. If you're after water, you can go to much smaller objects, maybe 20 meters across. So 100 meters is like a football stadium, right, mm -hmm. size. And 20 meters is like, I don't know, a McMansion or something, right? Right. And uh, so something that size, is, it could be worth a billion dollars worth of water because water is much, uh, there's a lot more water in the carbonaceous ones than there is platinum in the, in the iron ones. So. Um, but then you look at the breakdown of which types there are, uh, which is what we were getting to, and 85% uh, of the near-Earth asteroids, roughly, are just dumb rock, silicate rock, with nothing very interesting, uh, nothing extremely valuable per kilogram in them. Uh, about 5% are iron meteorites, uh, sort of asteroids, uh, and they have um, platinum, and many of them have, are rich in platinum. We'll get to that in a bit. And then about 10% uh, are carbonaceous, so rich in uh, water. And well, some of them are rich in water, and, but they contain a lot of organic molecules. So we're looking at 15% a, a, a of the total population is worth looking, taking a second look at. So about 15% of... 20,000, that's about 3,000 asteroids. Uh-huh. Okay. But, so, but, that's not, but we didn't put in that delta V cut yet. Right. Okay, so how, we, we have something called PACC, which is, means probability that it's accessible. Right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that distribution depends strongly on the delta V. Right? Very strongly, unfortunately. And, and so uh, of those 3,000 asteroids, how many uh, have you identified as accessible? Uh, a few percent. Remember, we don't, we don't actually know where all these 20,000 are yet. Uh, they haven't been discovered yet. But we, from the numbers uh, we have discovered and the way in which the survey was carried out, you can estimate quite accurately how many uh, remain undiscovered. So most of them we haven't yet found. Right. But, but we know that that's the total population quite accurately. Yeah, so the, the, the number of uh, under, 20 me under 20 meters is probably... A very large number. But. Oh, that gets up into the many millions, yeah. yeah. And down to 20 meters. And the, and the slo slope of how, how quickly they, uh, how many more there are as you go down in uh, size, it's roughly 10 times for every half halving of the size, right, of the diameter. Mm -hmm. So by the time you get to uh, 20 meters, it's more like, oh, 2 million, which is a huge number. Right. Right, but now we take, of both of these, we, we only expect about 3% to be accessible with our current rather feeble rocketry. Okay. And uh, so we're down. The, the next factor would, was uh, what you call the engineering factor, which is... Ah, no, there's one more. There's oh. richness. Oh, richness. the richness, right. Yes, the richness, yes. So that I took some meteorite uh, work because that gives us samples, little... Okay adulterated samples, because they have come through the atmosphere and all that, uh, of what is in these asteroids. And you can just, so what we care about is how rich they are in the thing we care about. So uh, hydrated minerals, percent weight of water, uh, and uh, of platinum in the two different types, carbonaceous and iron. Right. So the bad news is that like half of each type are either very dry or very poor in platinum, right? So that, that's bad news. Uh, it certainly doesn't guarantee, it, just knowing that you've got a nice carbonaceous asteroid does not guarantee water. Okay. Uh, 
But then again, some good fraction of them, like a quarter, will have 10% water, and that's huge. Right. And there's no way to tell that through a telescope? or you have to Not have to... really, no. What we can tell through a telescope is which kind it is. Is it carbonaceous, stony, or metallic? Right. With, with you know, never perfect, but with decent confidence. But then we have about a 50-50 chance of that being a rich... Well, being really usefully rich, probably one in four. Okay. Which is actually pretty good, then. Yeah. All right, so... Um... The, and then, uh, yeah, sorry. Oh, uh, well, I was just going to, um, so, so the actual population that we know of, it is perhaps a hundred ish asteroids that are reachable. Is that, uh, impossibly rich enough or so I, I'm looking at your paper at your uh, table yeah. here. Yes. Uh, you end, you end up with a handful, like a dozen. Uh, that are um, rich enough in platinum, and uh, several uh, thousand that are rich enough in water, and so uh, that makes you want to go for the water. Yeah, and you know those numbers are a bit bit unsure because I should have you know you could do a more sophisticated calculation, and because a very a very rich one can be smaller and still be profitable, right? And I didn't do right. that more careful calculation because the data wasn't really good enough to uh, justify it, but I'm trying to improve that now. Mm -hmm. um, the, the difficulty with the carbonaceous, small carbonaceous asteroids is they're, they're blacker than a blackboard. They're blacker than asphalt, and so they, they reflect very little light, and, and they're very small. So to see them, they have to come extremely close to the Earth with any of the current survey telescopes or even any planned survey telescopes on the ground. So that's, we're not, just not going to find many of those uh, in the near future. Could you find them better with an infrared telescope? Absolutely, yes. And I'm a great fan of the, both the Sentinel mission that's uh, being proposed by the B612 Foundation and perhaps more promisingly because NASA just selected it for study, uh, as a discovery mission, I think that's right, uh, is Amy Meinzer at JPL. She's a PI of NeoCam, which will survey the whole sky uh, at a clever location between the Earth and the Sun and uh, should, should be a very good at seeing these things. Well, instead, the reason is that the infrared, you go long enough in wavelength and you see them glowing just from their, their temperature. So right. about the same temperature as Earth or same temperature as any of us, and you've probably seen these uh, heat cameras uh, right. where you can see yourself glowing, right? Those are working at about 10 microns in wavelength. And uh, that's a convenient wavelength for doing the, these um, surveys of the sky. So uh, Amy's NeoCam, for instance, will scan the sky a number of times and will find pretty much all of the 100-meter uh, uh, stadium-sized uh, asteroids, near-Earth asteroids, uh, in a few years, and a good, very large number of smaller ones, not as complete, because not all of them will come near enough, even for her telescope, but uh, they'll be pretty darn good. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, so it seems to me that um, since you can't tell from a telescope how rich the asteroid is, that, and that sort of leads us to your next paper. Yeah. Uh, we have to go, we have to go prospecting. Yeah. Um, now you, you have, uh, you have, you wrote a paper called how many assay probes to find one ore bearing asteroid. That's right. Uh, that also came out in 2013. Yeah. Um, the, uh, that, that paper, um, proposes, uh, sort of, I guess these are fairly small probes. Right. So, so you probably had people talking about the uh, asteroid mining companies, uh, deep oh, space yeah. industries, uh, and planetary resources. Sure, yeah. And so you, you, your listeners are probably familiar with that. But basically, they want to set, make many small, uh, like um, not quite shoebox size, but a little bigger, weighing just a 10 kilogram kind of class or 20 pound class um, probes. And they... And, boldly making them capable of going on interplanetary distances. 
uh, out to asteroids, near-Earth asteroids. And then they will prospect those asteroids up, up close, right, at least within a kilometer, perhaps even landing on them, depends what they end up doing. We don't know because they're private companies. That's fine. But that's the general idea. Right. And even so, uh, they don't let out too many numbers, but there was one saying that one of these would cost about $5 million. And that's a plausible ballpark kind of number. Mm-hmm. But that means, and if you're going to get a billion dollars worth of ore back from your first asteroid, then how much of your budget, how much of that billion dollars will you want to have spent on prospecting the things in the first place? Probably no more than 10%. So that's $100 million. So that's, that would be uh, 20 probes, right? Right. Well, in that case, you'd better know something about the asteroid you're going to look at, uh, you're going to visit before you get there. Because if you don't know anything, and you just know that they're a certain brightness in the optical in the sky, and you have an orbit for them, which is all we know about almost all of the asteroids right now. That's, even, even the orbits are pretty dodgy, uh, pretty dubious in many cases. Um, then you will need at least 100 probes to have a good chance of uh, getting one ore bearing asteroid. So that sounds like very bad news, because um, that would then cost them, what, uh, $500 million. Right. Well, that's, that blows the budget. Mm-hmm. They, they still haven't gone and prospect. They still haven't gone and uh, uh, mined anything at that point, and they're only going to get back maybe a billion, a billion dollars, about, of, of order a billion dollars. So that's not very promising. So you have to cut that cost enormously. And, of course, the good news is uh, astronomers to the rescue, we, we can do that for you by saying, nope, that's the, that 85% are just rubble. You don't want to look at those. And uh, if you want to go for after water, we can make it a little better because we can throw away the ones that look metallic uh, or vice versa. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so that's uh, – now, in, your, in this paper, um, you calculated the uh, – uh, the number of assay probes needed to find one good asteroid, mm-hmm. depending on how on the the probability of how rich the asteroid was, right? Right. Uh, and you got it down pretty small to uh, even the ninety nine percent confidence level. If you if you know if you have a if you have p rich up to point five, it could be only seven probes. That's right. Yeah. But how 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 good can you get it? Though I mean that's. Well, I, I think that's the number that we had uh, P uh, rich from the previous yeah. paper. If you know what type of asteroid it is, then what's the chance of it being a rich asteroid in water or platinum? And it's, it's like a third or a quarter. It depends where you want to draw the line. You can, if, you can, if you insist on a richer return, then you're going to have fewer asteroids right. and, uh, higher, and you're going to need to probe more of them. But so I would say somewhere around 0.25 there, a quarter, put that in. So and, you get about 10. 17 probes then. Was, Something like that, yeah. yeah. But so that's a big difference from, uh, from 100. So you cut your, your expenses by five times. And I think this is a, a business-making pro, uh, you know, investment. If they, if they knew that, then they have a much, better, much more of a closed business case than, than they do at present. I see. Because as the table points out, if you don't know what it is, if you don't know the probability, it it's hundreds of probes, right? So yeah, at uh, least a hundred. Yeah, there could be more. Yeah. So uh, and, and this, I, is, this is inescapable. This is just what we call binomial statistics, and there is it's like it's you trying to pick blindfolded uh, jelly beans out of a out of a jar, and if one in ten is uh, is the flavor you like, then uh, you're going to have to pick out dozens before to be sure to get one of them. Now, would these probes be uh, would there be what like one for metals or one for water, or would you would it look for both? Uh, that's the next order question. Is uh, suppose the astronomers have found the right, uh, you know, promising set of asteroids, or at least thrown away the uh, the stony rubble ones? What instruments do you want to put on your uh, asteroid probe? Go out there and I say assay the asteroid and. Um, the, the trouble is, if you just stick to optical or infrared spectroscopy with your colorful color imaging, right, on the grounds of different rocks have different colors, right. which is clearly true, you, you mostly just learn about the same things you could tell through a telescope from the ground, 
except now you can see whether there's, it's patchy or not because you're up close and you can resolve the surface into small areas. Mm. But uh, you can't tell much. So I think the, there's a lot of work to be done thinking about the instrumentation and to put on those uh, probes and to see if you can make it small enough and light enough and all the rest of it to still be it still do the diagnostic uh, diagnostic work you need. Uh, the, now and the I water, don't. yeah, the water's likely to be under the surface a bit, isn't it? Uh, Gu- guaranteed to be, yes. Yeah. Uh, of course, the the um, in fact, yes, the that there could be clays inside that uh, got a certain amount of water in them, but on the surface, it's it's pretty much likely to be baked out. I think. So how how deep do you have to go to find the water typically? I, that's strange. I, I uh, they they say, and I'm not an expert on this really, that uh, the the heating depth the bit that is not that uh, deep. It's a few centimeters, a few inches. Hmm. Uh, that it, but the thing is, that assumes that the the asteroid has always been at the location it is in the orbit it is. Right. And uh, these asteroids were were basically uh, knocked out of the main belt by a kind of chaotic process and have then uh, have swung into the inner solar system and may well have gone around nearer the sun and, and uh, done a, a pass past Venus or the Earth or something earlier before they reached this orbit. And if they went too far in, then, of course, they could have been baked out, perhaps even totally. So we don't know uh, any, particular, any particular one. We don't know what its history was. So is there a good way to, uh, what, what do you think is the best way to get underneath the surface? It would be just to blast a hole or? Uh... That's a good idea. I just got a uh, paper from a guy at uh, Santa Barbara who loves the idea of shining laser beams onto them and, and getting plumes of emission of gas coming off because you vaporize the surface. And then you can tell what it is from gas spectroscopy, which is much more sensitive than, than solid, uh, than spectroscopy of solids. Minerals are very boring. Uh, to look at in spectra, but uh, gases have a lot more features you can use as diagnostics of what the thing is made of. So it's similar to what they, uh, the Mars Curiosity rubber then does so with the yeah, this yeah. laser. Yeah, so maybe that's the kind of instrument uh, one should look at. Absolutely. Uh, the trouble is, well, it might be the power that you have on these things, on, on the uh, these small probes, because it, it probably has to be a few watts. Right. Yeah. If that's small, they have to be yeah. Or, or, they, or you can maybe have some kind of uh, capacitor thing where you can fire a powerful beam, but only for a few seconds or a second, and then you have to store it up again and then fire again. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, the uh, now looking for metals is a little simpler, right? You could just uh, you're looking for essentially elements at that. Yeah. At that. Yeah. So I, I, we, we here are working on instrumentation because of our ast- astrophysics background with Chandra on X-ray uh, instruments that could do this. And we've actually started getting uh, involved in uh, planetary missions and designing our X-ray telescopes to work, uh, to be lightweight and uh, low power and all the rest of it that you have to do, radiation hardened and everything. Yeah, and I believe uh, the NEAR mission flew an X-ray gamma ray spectrometer. Well, yeah, but the, 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 we in astrophysics are roughly 30 years ahead of the instrumentation that was flown on that. In fact, they're flying instruments that were proven back in the 70s, basically, and we haven't used that kind of gas proportional counter, it's called, for, for decades, not since about 1980. So now we use solid-state uh, silicon devices like CCD cameras, and uh, they're so much better. Because we, they come with uh, energy resolution, they can you, every every picture, every pixel of every picture you take, you get a spectrum. So you can tell in every pixel what elements are present. Hmm. So this is this I think is is very valuable. But we don't quite have the technology yet. We need to develop it. There's a little bit of uh, development funding we're going to have to get. So. Is that would that funding come from the private sector? Or? Well, right now we're still applying for NASA funding. Uh, we haven't uh, explored private or philanthropic approaches yet. I see. Uh, so this this would these instruments would tell you very precisely what metals were on the surface of the yes. of the asteroid. Yes. Uh, whether you could, you wouldn't immediately detect platinum. So another thing I'm doing is trying to find a good proxy for platinum richness. 
to see if there's some other element or ratio of, oh, there's, if there's that much gold and that much nickel and that much whatever, then yes, we are very likely to see that it's full of uh, platinum. Right. Because, so we're working on that. Because say, taking a sample and analyzing will be very, very expensive. Uh, You'd think. Uh, and yeah. as, soon, as soon as you contact the surface, your engineering gets a lot more complicated. Right, right. Because you have to have landing, you have to have legs or some means of means of attachment, and then and, and be sure that and lots of uh, navigation, uh, autonomous navigation to make sure you don't land on a boulder and topple over. And uh, generally, it gets a lot more complicated. So doing it remotely, even if it's a uh, hundred meters away, uh, is much better. Yeah, just from the complexity. Yeah, if you're gonna have, yeah. if you want to build twenty of them for a hundred million dollars, that's Nice. Oh, well, right. Yeah. Yes. You're not going to have, you're going to have very simple instruments on board, right? Mm -hmm. So it could be that when they, they've done this of enough asteroids, you found uh, a few promising ones, and then you might have a more capable inst uh, spacecraft you send to do the uh, surface contact experiments. I, I don't know what the plans are of those companies, but that seems a logical thing to do. Now, the, uh, the conclusion you reached were basically uh, based upon uh, sort of a statistical model of uh, of how many uh, you know, how many asteroids are out there, and sort of it's sort of like uh, yeah. if you place enough bets, you'll eventually win one, right? Uh, yes, it's like I said, it's pulling uh, pulling uh, jelly beans out of a jar blindfold and hoping you know how many do you have to pull out to get the right one, your favorite flavor. Right. Now, are you hoping to learn more from uh, say Osiris Rex? Uh, uh, yes, but uh, Cyrus Rex won't give its results back. In fact, we have a, an experiment on board that. Uh, I say we. I, I'm not really a member of the team. Uh, I'm not a member of the team, but uh, I, I'm talking to people. I was kind of the, uh, what would you call it, uh, uh, matchmaker between MIT and Harvard. Uh, it happened. I was a, a course at MIT. I was helping out with... Uh, Jeff Hoffman and uh, Rick Binzel, and Rick Binzel announced that there was an opportunity to fly a, a um, student-built experiment. And so I immediately said, obviously an X-ray uh, spectrometer. And he went, they're horrible, because he was thinking of the ones that were 30 years old, right, in technology terms. Mm -hmm. And luckily, both I and Jeff Hoffman were saying, no, they, we've come a long way. And uh, it was amazing. I've never seen such a thing. It, we wrote a one-page uh, proposal with the guys at Harvard who'd been working on exactly the right technology, it turned out, uh, who lived, worked just down the hall from me. And uh, within six months, it was accepted. And that was five years ago, more or less. And they, they'd, just, they'd just delivered the instrument for integration into OSIRIS-REx. So the, this will be the first modern uh, X-ray investigation of, a, of an asteroid. Right. Now, there are some asteroids that are thought to briefly come into the Earth-Moon system. Yes. Uh, is there much hope of detecting those and intercepting one of those? I would, it'd be great. Uh, uh, the, so the, um, what are they called, mini-moons or temporary moons. Yes. And uh, there's certainly good ideas for that. The, the, they might be good to, as test uh, asteroids to start learning how to use uh, to how to mine them and extract them, um, valuable resources from them. But typically they're in orbit, sort of orbit. They're in their uh, convenient location for maybe a year. And uh, we get roughly, is I think it's one a year or one every few years, it's about a meter or bigger across. So, you know, not, not, uh, not, a, not something you're going to make a profit on out of one of those. You'd need a whole series of them just to really start making money off them. Right. But, but the Delta V cost could be very low if you were, already had something in orbit. Right? It could be zero, yeah. It's like, you know, meters per second, very little. So the, the rocketry isn't so much of a problem. You have to have your rocket ready to go, pretty much, so that you can make the intercept uh, in a sensible time and still have it near to you before it gets kicked out again uh, within a year, typically. So you have to act fast. And that, that's the problem that kind of capability is then a little more expensive. Right. Um, now, the uh, I, I, I couldn't let you go till I 
uh, get your opinion on an related un, unrelated to mining, but uh, I wanted to know what you thought of the uh, the Dawn mission and what it's been dis- what it's discovered at uh, at Ceres. Oh, it's beautiful. It's gorgeous. I, I yes, I'm of course disappointed that the white spots are not an alien uh, spacecraft. But uh, <laughs> there you go. We were having bets on it, and actually, yeah, we all wished it would be, but nobody believed it would be. In fact, <laughs> it's not. So it's it. it so I heard an interesting statistic about this. They, what the white stuff is probably related to uh, uh, ice under the surface. And uh, Ceres is about 25% water. I'm not proposing we go and mine the entire asteroid of Ceres and destroy it in doing so. But uh, it turns out that Ceres is vastly wetter than the Earth. And how many uh, Ceres would have to crash into the Earth to fill up the oceans? I think, well, I don't know, hundreds, thousands. And the answer is six. Hmm. So it makes to me, it makes it more and more plausible to me that the Earth's oceans did come from being were delivered by asteroid impact or could have been asteroids rather than just comets. Right. But we don't know which, of course, at the moment. So that that uh lone mountain on series could be just like a ice volcano or something? Oh, no idea. Sorry, not my thing. That's <laughs> That's that's what they keep talking about on on uh, Pluto, right? These wonderful uh, ice mountains. They have ice mountains, yeah. Great, but that of course is a lot colder than Sirius. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I uh, I've yet to find somebody who will, who will actually speculate on what the, how that got there. I have no idea. <laughs> Just not what I do. Uh, and of course, it's another alien spaceship, but uh, I didn't say that. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> it'd be an awfully big one. Yeah, uh, it was huge. Yeah. Uh, the um, so let's kind of, uh, can bring this all together and ask, uh, sort of say, sort of summarize, where do you think, uh, what, what the missing pieces are, what, what, yep. where, where NASA could help and, uh, what, what the private company need to do. Certainly. So, uh, fly the Neo, Amy Mines' NeoCam mission. That would be great because then we will actually know where all of the big asteroids are, near earth asteroids and many other, uh, main belt asteroids. Um, Invest in two things on the ground for astronomy. The f- most basic is track these asteroids long enough to get an accurate orbit because a very large fraction of the ones now being discovered are effectively lost. It will be very hard to find them again next time around. And at the same time, take spectra of every astero- every near-Earth asteroid as it's discovered because, again, it- the next time around, uh, it's going to be much fainter. You can talk to Jose Luis Galache about that in detail uh, another time, maybe. I will, yes. But uh, that, that we worked quite hard on that one. And so I did propose to NASA to, uh, to do that, and they rejected me uh, twice. So I'm a little discouraged about that. I'm trying to see if I can find some other way. But you need, uh, you need a pretty big telescope, a three- or four-meter telescope, and you need dedicated equipment, that's instrumentation that's designed for this. And you need professional astronomers who can get accurate uh, spectra out because it, the subtle features we're looking for demand that. So, you know, it's not wildly expensive, but it is, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not free. It's, uh, it takes some serious effort. So these would be the ground-based telescopes. Uh, ground-based telescopes. Like, and, yeah. and those would be basic building blocks of information that the, tr- the people going out to prospect at the asteroids will need before, if they have to make a profit. Right. And uh, what do you think the uh, the private company should be doing next? Uh, I think they should, uh, apart from supporting me in this venture, <laughs> uh, which they aren't very interested in right now, apparently, they should think a lot more carefully about the instrumentation they want to send out because I suspect they're, they don't have the right ones right now. But, of course, I'm not privy to their innermost thoughts, just the sort of things they say in talks, and they never talk about instruments in a big way. So I, I think they're a bit lacking there. But on the positive side, I, I don't see why within 10 years we shouldn't be able to have a whole bunch of asteroids that are good targets ready to mine. And so real prospecting can start real, real prospecting can start soon and real extraction experiments, at least, first attempts within a decade, I think, is quite, quite plausible. Okay. Uh, well, um, any last thoughts on this before we wrap up? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, despite sounding like negative because I put in the numbers and don't find a huge number of uh, good asteroids, 
you know, it's like finding a gold mine on Earth. It's not every mountain that's like that. So uh, uh, if we do the work and find the right ones, then I think we've got a, a, a great future in, in space with uh, space resources. Well, well, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Martin Elvis. Okay, great. Thanks. I, I appreciate your time. Pleasure. Bye. Bye-bye. Well, thank you to Dr. Martin Elvis of the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. I think that after reading Martin Elvis's papers and speaking to him and getting him to answer my questions, I have a much better feel for the science behind asteroid mining and where it needs to go, where it, the deficiencies are, uh, and what we actually already do know and how important it is. So, uh, and as I think he pointed out, he is an enthusiast for asteroid mining, but he wants people to be realistic about what's going to be required to make that successful. So uh, hopefully over the next few months and years, we'll be hearing a lot more about that. Maybe we'll get back to Martin Elvis and other experts on where the state of the knowledge is currently about what asteroids are most likely to be, have water have other important minerals and and are correctly positioned to be accessible and easily mined. So all that is evolving as we speak. Every year there's been some developments and we'll have links in the show notes to many of the things that he was talking about, including to all his papers. So I too am also an optimist and enthusiastic about asteroid mining. I think the economy that's there now, the market that there that's there now is, in fact, quite small, but will grow. And once it bootstraps, once everything is there in place, it, will, it can grow a lot. We'll find out. We won't know till we go there. Well, this has been episode two of season three of The Wow Signal. Thanks for listening. If you would like to help support the Wow Signal financially, you can do so at patreon.com slash wow signal. There's a link at wowsignalpodcast.com. And you go over there and just pledge a small amount, uh, maybe a dollar a month or uh, something, or I'm sorry, for the Wow Signal, it's per episode. For the Unseen Podcast, it's per month. So a dollar per episode, uh, which is plenty. And, and if 10% of my listeners pledged a dollar per episode, we would have all our costs easily covered and could do more than that. So thank you very much if you have supported. Our most recent patrons are Alex Green and Chris Watkins. So thank you for your support, folks. And I hope you will consider that money well invested. We also need your help by doing such things as giving, leaving a review on iTunes or whatever your favorite podcast aggregation service is. Uh, also, you can help us by retweeting and following us on Twitter at Podcast Wow, and then retweeting our episode announcements. There's a lot of things you can do to help that require either no money or little money and very little time. So we'd appreciate anything that you can do. We would certainly like to hear from you. What are your ideas for the show? Who do you think should be on the show as guests? And how can we improve the show? What topics would you like to see covered you don't think that we're missing? Uh, so please go to wowsignalpodcast.com. And I think everything you need to know is there. We have subreddits. We have a Google Plus community. So you can go in and comment and post there as well. Again, links to that all are at wowsignalpodcast.com. I also hope you'll listen to the Unseen Podcast and participate in the Unseen Podcast. It is open participation. All you have to do is go over to unseenpodcast.com and there's information there about how you can sign up to be in the panel pool. We would really like to get see some new panelists. We've had 19 so far. Uh, more would be good. And we're, we have, we're up now to episode 31 on that show. And so we, would, we do that every week. 
So if you would like to participate in that show, um, we'd like to have you. You don't have to be an expert in anything. You just have to have good questions. Now, I hope you caught our latest burst about why interstellar flight is hard. Perhaps that was a little too elementary for some of you. I completely understand. But that was just an opening salvo. We do want to cover interstellar travel more in the future on the WOW signal from multiple perspectives. If you have suggestions for whom we should talk to, perhaps it should be you, let me know. You can email wowsignalpodcast at gmail.com or you can go over to the website and just leave a comment on the blog. So more bursts are coming soon, more episodes are coming soon, and more about asteroid mining will come soon. We also want to continue to cover SETI, and we'll do that as well. And I hope that very soon we'll have the perspective of some other people on SETI, and in particular on the recent discovery of some rather strange light curves for a star about 1,500 kilometers, sorry, sorry, 1,500 light years away. So uh, we plan to keep our eye on all that for you. And this is where you learn about the human search for life in the cosmos and why we're not that life in the cosmos and how we can become it. So we appreciate your listening. Please subscribe to the podcast. That'll make it very easy for both of us. Just uh, there's a link at wowsignalpodcast.com that says subscribe. Click on that and we'll give you some information. If you can't figure out how to subscribe with the software you use to listen to podcasts, we will help you. Just to send us an email. We'll, we'll figure it out for you if we have to. So we'd love to hear from you anyway, uh, even if, if it's a problem like that. So thanks again. And thank you to our musicians, uh, DJ Spooky, Jason Robinson, and Erica Lloyd. And we'll go out with a little bit of more music by DJ Spooky, Thoughts Like Rain. This has been The Wow Signal, a podcast produced by the Dream of the Open Channel. Please visit wowsignalpodcast.com for more information. All music presented on this podcast is either Creative Commons or is presented with the permission of the artist. The Wow Signal is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike License.